Hello everyone, today I want to read you an essay on sociology of education focusing on functionalism and conflict theory. Sociology of education is a field of study which combines two disciplines, sociology and education. Therefore, understanding sociology of education requires that we firstly interrogate the definitions of these terms separately, then further discuss them jointly as an interdisciplinary concept. Let's begin by unpacking the concept and aims of education. Educational theorists concede that there is no single universal term or strictly allocated definition to describe education as a concept. Education is not one specific thing, but it relates to the aims and outcomes of the process of educating or teaching, which happens formally at the school and informally at home or other social institutions like the church. Consider the following examples. A pencil can be defined as a small object or stationary tool with a plastic or wood exterior. It is used to draw or sketch and it uses lead instead of ink. A pencil can be sharpened and its writings on paper can be erased using a rubber eraser. A car is a four-wheeled mode of transport which uses fuel such as petrol or diesel to function and its aim is to help people commute or travel from place to place with ease. Note that with the above described objects, a car and pencil, it was easy to point out the features, aims, and characteristics of each thing. However, the same does not apply to the concept of education. We cannot simply define education as one specific thing, hence educational theorists like R.S. Peters have said the following about the concept of education. Education is a process or act of social conditioning. Peters argues that formal education can be used as means to inculcate life values and principles to members of society, to teach them right from wrong. This means that teachers at schools are not only responsible for teaching their subject matter, but are equally responsible for playing the role of mentor and moral agent. In fact, when teachers sign their school contract, they agree to be in loco parentis, which means that they are entering into a legal agreement where they are placeholders for parents during school hours. Therefore, the guidance and discipline that would be carried out by parents in the home becomes the role of teachers at schools. Education is also a means to obtain knowledge. Educational content can help us analyze the physical world around us. It can also help us understand world problems and their causes. Education brings the rest of the world closer to us, where we can, for example, learn about cultures and people we have never met in great detail. Subjects such as history and social studies help us understand the evolution of societies through different lenses, while natural sciences help us understand our bodies and environments better. So education here as the accumulation of knowledge and information serves the purpose of enlightenment, making us wiser and more informed about matters pertaining to the rest of the world and all the people who live in it. So we have now answered the question, what is education? But another important question to add here is, why is education important in our societies today? What value does it add in our communities? What is the purpose of educational institutions such as schools, universities, colleges, and so on? Should you even get a degree, right? And the first way to answer this question is realizing that education is a tool to access economic mobility. For example, getting a university degree can lead to employment opportunities which improve one's standard of living, earning potential, and social status. Particularly in developing countries with a hard history of colonialism and racial discrimination, education also plays the role of leveling the playing field and pulling previously marginalized groups into the economy. These are the social justice aims of education, where equal opportunities for success are created for all, through access to formal education. Secondly, education helps societies become more productive. Most countries in the world today are capitalistic economies, where the ability to work and sell one's labor for a remuneration is essential for survival. We live in a world where the cost of living is constantly increasing and life becomes uncomfortable if one does not have a necessary skill set for obtaining employment. Therefore, the role of formal education today largely involves equipping people with the skills and competencies necessary to secure employment and contribute towards the country's productivity. 
Governments need the taxes of skilled workers to generate national revenue and to finance national expenditure. Therefore, in order to keep the society productive, it's important to ensure that everyone is skilled and is an equipped laborer. So what is sociology? Thankfully, sociology is not as difficult to define as education. It is a social science that focuses on society, human social behavior, patterns of social relationships, social interaction, and aspects of culture associated with everyday life. Sociological research has influenced throughout various industries and sectors of life, such as amongst politicians, policymakers, health practitioners, and educators. What is sociology of education then? It is a field of social sciences dedicated to understanding how societal factors influence education. It seeks to explore how formal forces of education strengthen or weaken already existing societal structures and cultures. We use theories of sociology to understand the structural institutions of society, to unpack their different purposes and principles, and to learn how they collaborate with educational institutions such as schools, colleges, and universities. Now we will discuss two theoretical perspectives within sociology, and these are functionalism and conflict theories. We want to highlight their relevance in educational theory, so joining them together. Functionalism is a sociological perspective which views society as a composition of different interdependent parts or institutions. These societal institutions include religion, education, media, law, politics, government, economics, and culture. This theory argues that all the institutions of a society serve a unique function and are necessary for the survival of that society, which entails that they work together hand in hand. Functionalist theories view individual members of society and the institutions mentioned earlier as interdependent. One cannot survive without the other. Interdependence can be described as the collab collaborative struggle within society to achieve similar or identical goals. A change in any one part of the society affects others, requiring other stakeholders to take account of the changes, modify their actions, and adapt to any changes necessary. The interdependence definition is a critical and distinctive feature of the functionalist analysis. Functionalism emphasizes that parts of society work together in harmony for society to function, thus looking at society at the macro level as one body that needs different organs to survive. Similar to how the body functions well when all the body parts are healthy and well nourished, functionalists believe that society will function smoothly when its different groups fulfill their respective roles effectively. Some of the main proponents of this theory are scholars such as Emile Durkheim, Herbert Spencer, and Talcott Parsons. Parsons argued that each individual occupies a status or position within a structure, further emphasizing the role fulfillment aspect of functionalism. For example, if parents and religious organizations fail to promote discipline amongst members of society, the police and other law enforcement agencies intervene to maintain safety, security, and discipline. If the family fails to teach a child constructive values and principles, the school intervenes through hidden curriculum and civil education. Different societal structures serve unique and vital functions, and the outcomes are undesirable, maybe disastrous, if there is a breakdown in any of these st structures. Additionally, Emil Durkheim argues that education in all societies is essential in creating moral unity, social cohesion, and harmony. He was particularly keen to emphasize the reinforcement of any and every factor that allows society to continue maintaining a collective identity and shared moral code. Durkheim felt that the rise of atheism and the decline in religiousness was a cause for concern, as it left people without consolation in times of trouble. He observed that industrialization and modern capitalism led to higher rates of suicide due to intense feelings of comparison and envy. Under capitalism, individuals also face the pressure to keep working for material gains, leading to unhappiness and feelings of insignificance or insecurity. Durkheim further argued that capitalism led to people working jobs that did not make them feel a sense of contributing to a higher purpose or being a part of something bigger than themselves. 
religion offered this. People feeling that they have a purpose and they are part of something bigger than them. According to Durkheim, education is essential for the primary socialization of young members of society. Primary socialization happens in three levels. Firstly, through instilling social so solidarity. Formal education content and structures encourage members of the society to work together for the achievement of common goals. Two, skills provision. Formal education provides one with skills that help them serve society through most career paths. For example, doctors help maintain the physical health of the nation, teachers shape young minds, builders provide infrastructure, while the police and army maintain national safety and security. Education helps societies perpetuate role allocation and maintain social order. For the mere fact that schools do not aggressively encourage entrepreneurship and a business mentality, we can concede that they prepare students for the world of work and being content as subservient employees in modern capitalism. So that is the link between functionalism and education. Conflict theories, on the other hand, are a Marxist theory. Karl Marx is the intellectual founder of conflict theories. He viewed capitalism as inherently harmful because it perpetuates class inequality and alienates the worker. Marx argued that under capitalism, members of society are divided into unequal economic classes, which are the proletariat and bourgeoisie. The proletariat are the owners of labor, the workers. They do not own firms or land, but without their labor, production cannot take place. On the other hand, we also have the bourgeoisie or the owners of the means of production. The bourgeoisie are the very top of the political and economic hierarchy, making decisions about who to hire from the proletariat and how much they ought to be remunerated for their labor while taking ownership of land and natural resources. The bourgeoisie also own all that is produced by the proletariat and sell it for a profit in retail outlets and other distributive mechanisms. The basis of conflict theories then is that society is inherently unstable and in conflict due to limited resources. Since the dominant class takes ownership of economic and natural resources and keeps all the profits from the sale of products made with the labor of the proletariat, Marx concludes that class conflict is inevitable. The working class is not blind. They can see how they are exploited and oppressed by the bourgeoisie and make attempts to stand up for themselves and reclaim their power because of knowing the importance of their labor. Since the dominant class benefits from exploiting the working class, they do their best to keep the working class in a subservient role and retaliate violently to the efforts of the working class when they demand higher wages or safer and better working conditions. The Marikana massacre is an example of this in South Africa, where mine workers were brutally murdered in a protest. While Marx focused on economic class as a reason for the conflict in society, other sociologists have made critical addition to Marx's original analysis of conflict in society. These sociologists observed that economic and political power is determined by ownership of resources, while the ownership of resources itself is determined by social constructs like race and gender. It is no surprise then that in countries such as the USA and South Africa, over 90% of the country's wealth is in the hands of white people, while people of color struggle to make ends meet. Therefore, we observe that Marx was limited in his perspective because of his predisposition as a white man, hence the need for a contribution to the conflict theory from sociologists belonging to different ethnic, gender, and race groups from Marx. Sociologists such as W.E. Dubois and Antonio Gramsci wrote about race conflict theories, culture, and hegemony. We also have leaders of feminist thought such as Bell Hooks and Carol Hanisch adding the layer of gender inequality to conflict theories. So not only do people become victims of exploitation and marginalization due to their economic class, they are further marginalized and oppressed due to their race, gender, sexual orientation, and disability. The second wave of feminism is often summarized with the slogan, personal is political, simply emphasizing that women's personal issues are all political issues that need political intervention to generate change. So we see the added layer here. 
We see increasing visibility of advocacy groups speaking to the issues faced by members of the LGBTIA plus community, which is an important aspect of destigmatizing queer and trans bodies and passing legislation which protects queer and trans people. All in all, conflict theories investigate the persistent nature of inequality in society and the reasons why certain groups tend to be more disadvantaged or marginalized than others. At this point, you might be asking yourself what this has to do with education, and that's a very important question. So let's unpack that and conclude this essay. According to Marx and other proponents of conflict theories, the main function of education in capitalistic countries is to create workers and nothing else. This might answer your question about why don't we learn in depth about writing businesses, investing, and other ways to create wealth through the school curriculum. The simple answer is that capitalism thrives on inequality. Therefore, schools must reproduce social inequalities in the values and content they teach to young members of society. That's the end of the essay. Thank you so much for watching. If you've reached this point of the video, make sure to engage in the comment section below should you have any further questions. Thank you so much for watching once more and see you next time.